Hello there. I'm Matt Cartmill, and I'd like to welcome you to the seventh iteration of the Boston University Dialogues in Biological Anthropology. This Dialogues program was started here at Boston University a little over four years ago with two objectives in mind. The first objective is simply to spotlight and bring to the attention of interested parties in the BU community and beyond interesting and important areas of current debate and controversy in the study of human biology and human evolution. Our second objective in these dialogues is to model a practice of civilized and productive discourse in scientific argument uh, that will provide a, a model of how things like, like this ought to proceed, how they in fact ordinarily do proceed in scientific circles out of the media spotlight, and that will provide a counterbalance to the sort of media convention that has grown up of always pitting irreconcilable antagonists against each other for maximum drama, but for a discourse that tends to generate a lot more heat than light. Today's discussion is going to have both heat and light in it, because our topic for today is Prometheus and Prehistory, Fire and Human Origins. We all know at some sort of an intuitive and obvious level that fire and the control of fire by human beings is one of the important things that distinguishes us from other animals and that it's of enormous adaptive importance to us in terms of our ability to warm ourselves, to cook our food, to provide light, uh, and uh, to defend ourselves um, against uh, wild animals. Uh, these things have always been important in the use of fire down through human history and prehistory. But recently they've come into even uh, more central focus uh, in uh, di dialogues and debates within biological anthropology as a result of the elaboration of what's sometimes called the cooking hypothesis. Uh, this body of theory, which has been uh, originated and spearheaded by Professor uh, Rangham at Harvard and by uh, some of his co-workers, contends that not only has, has fire been important in, in human adaptations throughout our evolutionary career, but that it also helped to shape the origins of the genus Homo itself. That human beings are unique among animals in not only cooking our food, but not being able to survive without it and that the practice of cooking food and other uses of fire associated with it have resulted in enormous changes in human diets, adaptations, brain size, the size of our teeth and jaws, our activity patterns, and even our uh, reproductive patterns. So the question of exactly when fire began to be used by human beings and how and where and for what purposes has taken on a new importance in the light of this newly elaborated body of theory. So we have here today with us two uh, experts on the uh, use of fire and its, uh, its origins in prehistory. Uh, and I'm going to introduce to you first uh, our visiting uh, expert from Stony Brook University, Professor John Shea, who is a world-renowned expert on all phases of Paleolithic ecology and uh, material culture from the beginnings of the uh, Old Stone Age two million years ago down to the Neolithic. And he's going to tell us about his personal take on the importance of fire, its antiquity, and its significance for human evolution. John? Thank you. Oh, for a muse of fire. Thus begins one of Shakespeare's more interesting plays. But I'm not going to give you a Shakespeare play. I'm going to focus in on what I call anthropogenic fire. Anthropogenic means of human origin. And so anthropogenic fire, we're speaking here about fire created by humans for, use, for, for our use and for the, our ancestors' use. Fire is a cultural universal. All known human societies know how to make and use fire. It's also uniquely human. No other animal controls fire, uses fire. Now, the historical view of fire in, in, in our accounts of our own species origins has ranged from supernatural explanations. It was a gift from the Greek, Greek titan, Prometheus, or it was stolen from the, from the gods by the, the Inuit hero, Raven. More recent scientific views retain this, this almost mythological quality to fire. It's seen as a transformative force in human evolution, something that changes us into us into ourselves. Now, 
We anthropologists and archaeologists draw our hypotheses about the past by observing behavioral variability amongst living humans. We know the past only as well as we understand the present. And so our perspective on fire and its origins and in, in use by early humans, in, in that we look at fire as a strategy, as a way of solving problems, and, and strategies have costs and benefits. So if we want to understand the role of fire in human evolution, we have to understand the various costs and benefits attending the use of fire by living humans. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about costs and benefits of fire as a strategy. And then in the rest of the talk, I'll review some of the evidence for human use of fire and hominin use of fire in the earlier phases of prehistory. I'll also wrap up or finish this by, by uh, co considering some of the interpretive problems and the issues we face in trying to shed greater light on the use of fire in, in human origins research. Okay. Now, the benefits of fire use are pretty straightforward. One could indeed say obvious. Heat, controlled heat, allows hominins who evolved in tropical environments to survive in cold ones. Anyone who, who has ever spent a, a night camping out in the cold when, when fire has failed knows that it's a crucial resource in cold environments. Cooking breaks down complex uh, toxins and, and uh, weakens uh, fibers that are present in meats and plants and enables us to eat foods with greater energy recovery. We can get more calories back per unit of, of calories expended in many different food sources. So it's an aid to cooking. Pyrotechnology, or the use of fire to create new materials, has transformed our ability to control the world around us. Fire can speed up carpentry. To carve a wooden spear with no, no fire to aid you with a bit of stone can take hours. It's a, my students accomplish this task in 20 to 30 minutes when they have recourse to fire. It aids in making clothing, tanning hides, by drying the hides out faster and more effectively than would otherwise be the case. And humans have even used fire to create new materials, materials that don't occur in easily manipulable forms in nature, such as ceramics and metals, metallurgy, iron, bronze, tin, these sorts of substances. It's a transformative force in an ecological sense as well. Many hunter-gatherers, and indeed agricultural populations as well, practice something called fire stick farming, a term coined by the late Australian archaeologist Rhys Jones. In fire stick farming, one burns the landscape, getting rid of older dead vegetation and encouraging new vegetation to grow. Essentially, it makes the, the, the environment around hunter-gatherer societies more suitable to the needs of hunter-gatherer societies, increasing the amount of green foliage available to prey animals. So it not only transforms us, it transforms our world. It's an effective anti-predator defense. The bright light that fire gives off blinds many of the nocturnal carnivores that stalked our, the nightmares of our ancestors' imagination. It's also an aid to social activities. Many of the visual clues we rely on to interpret you know, how, what someone means, whether they're telling the truth or telling a joke, these visual clues can be extended into the night when, they're, when the tales and the stories are told by the side of a fire. Now, those are some of the benefits. They're pretty obvious. People, anthropologists, don't spend as much time thinking about the costs of fire. That's a, that's a function that's familiarity. We take this, this resource for granted. Easily the most appreciable cost in fire is, is knowing how to create it, how to ignite it. To get fire, you need to bring fuel and, and, and oxygen and heat together. And it's not an easy thing to do. Even people who know how to make fire by, by collision products, flint and steel, or by friction, shown here, the most common method for kindling fire. To do this effectively, even under the best of circumstances, takes you know, hours and hours and hours of practice. Imagine how much more difficult it is to do this in the rain or in the snow or when your entire tribe depends on you getting it right the first time. Another factor that people don't think about in terms of costs is fuel. Okay, well, maybe we all do when we get our, our uh, oil bills. But in an area habitually occupied by fire-using humans, the landscape gets stripped of burnable materials very quickly. And then the, you, you face an energetic shift. It becomes more expensive to obtain fuel. So more and more of the energy that you're theoretically capturing with fire gets shifted over into the costs of procuring fuel to fuel the fire. You can see you pretty, can get into a vicious circle. And uh, you know, in many parts of, of the world where humans have been using fire for hundreds of thousands of years or, or less, people are living in deserts, stripped of all possible burning materials. In fact, it gets so bad that in some parts of the world, people burn the dung of animals, having 
long since gone through any, any wood that might have been used for fire. When we anthropologists and archaeologists, and paleoanthropologists, when we look for fire, we're looking for spatially concentrated occurrences of the following th three things. We're looking for burnt stone tools, flints and other materials that respond in a distinctive kind of way to exposure to fire. We're looking for charred bones, either bones charred in the course of cooking or more often bones that are simply in the geological substrate when, when a fire was kindled on top of them. We're also looking for ash deposits, places where carbonized materials have been, been preserved in, in the geological record. And here's an example of precisely this kind of evidence from a site in Israel called Kibara Cave. These are deposits that date to between about 45,000 years ago to about 65,000 years ago. We think they were made by Neanderthals because the bottom of this trench, we found one <laughs> buried, <coughs> buried under the hearths. This is the kind of thing that's clear and convincing, for bad joke, sorry, but smoking gun evidence of fire. So this is a, a, a good example. This isn't typical for the remote periods of the archaeological record. So what I want to turn to now is a very brief review of the major periods of, of prehistory and the evidence that we, we apprehend at the moment about fire in these various periods. So, for the Holocene Epoch, the period we're living in right now, and in, ha in, in which we have been living for the last 12 and a half thousand years, evidence of fire is ubiquitous. It's found every place. Now, it's not found in every archaeological site. There are, of course, gaps, but these gaps are small. They're on the order of a few decades or centuries in any given region. The larger pattern is of near universal fire use by humans who've lived since the end of the Ice Age, or since 12 and a half thousand years ago in the Holocene Epoch. And probably the most distinctive feature of, of uh, fire use during this Holocene, or recent epoch, is the production of new materials such as metal by the controlled application of fire at very, very high temperatures. Temperatures sufficient to extract iron from ore, to extract copper and tin and other materials, enabling us to make a novel materials like bronze, an alloy, or combination of copper and tin. When we turn to the late Pleistocene epoch, so between 12 and a half thousand years ago to 128,000 years ago, we find evidence for fire is common, but it's not ubiquitous. That is to say, it's present on all the major continents on which members of our genus, genus Homo, are present. It's associated with, with Neanderthals and with Homo sapiens, the two best known of these late Pleistocene hominins. And some of the distinctive applications of fire that we find, largely associated with Homo sapiens, our species, is the production of ceramics, so vessels made of, of, of uh, fired clay, and images of animals and humans made of fired clay as well. The, the oldest application of pyrotechnology is the production of figurines rather than of vessels, inverting the usual t textbook story of ceramics origins. We also find very early evidence of humans using fire to control mineral pigments, to, to change the color of, of minerals, pigments that occur in, in their environment, shifting the colors to a particular variety of red. There's even some evidence from this time period of humans doing what we call heat treatment, altering the fracture properties of stone by exposing stone to fire at elevated temperatures in order to cause small fractures in the quartz crystals of the rocks and enable earlier tool makers to fracture the rocks with less, less effort than would otherwise be the case. When we turn to the Middle Pleistocene, the period between about 128,000 years ago to about 700,000 years ago, this is a kind of transition period in the evidence for fire. That is to say, the, the evidence is relatively good at the more recent end of the time range, but it's very, very spotty at the very remote end of, of the period. Now, during the Middle Pleistocene, the archaeological record is kind of spotty. It's not evenly investigated. The best evidence for, for um, the archaeological record of the Middle Pleistocene comes from Western Europe, excuse me, comes from Europe and Western Asia. A recent survey of this archaeological record for fire use in, in Europe concluded that the, the, the evidence for consistent use of fire, for use of fire that's repetitive, and it suggests a pattern and a habit of fire use, really only comes from about 200 to 300,000 years ago and, in, and more recently than that. So the final, final 100,000 years or thereabouts of the Middle Pleistocene about the time that Neanderthals were differentiating themselves from their Homo heidelbergensis ancestors, and roughly the time that our species, Homo sapiens, was evolving in Africa. Earlier than that, the evidence is very spotty. It's not the sort of thing I've been talking about here with ashes and, and burnt flints. The evidence, by spotty, I mean you would find occasional burnt flints, or occasionally a conjunction of ash and burnt bones and fire. 
It's not consistent. Indeed, this evidence, it, it, when it stands, when, when you find it, it tends to stick out like a sore thumb from an archaeological record in which evidence for fire is less obvious or less, less ubiquitous. During the Middle Pleistocene, the, the most distinctive kind of, of pyrotechnology, the creation of new materials, is the creation of mastic or glue. There are many different kinds of plants, particularly birch and pine, that secrete uh, uh, sticky substances, mastic, and one can make glues out of these things with a proper application of fire. If you really want to make very good pine, pine pitch glue, you simply mix the pine pitch with a, an equal measure of charcoal, apply heat until it's liquid, and you've made yourself uh, Stone Age uh, uh, super glue. Where the evidence really begins to get, get, get uh, murky is in the early Pleistocene, so about 700,000 years ago to 2.5 million years ago. Now, the best evidence from this time period comes from a site in Israel called Gesher Benat Yaakov, Hebrew for the Bridge of Jacob's Daughters. It's a site located in the Jordan Valley. At this site, we find conjunctions of burnt flints, we find carbonized plant remains, and we find burnt bones all together. So, but this is very near the end of this time period. Earlier evidence for fire during the, the early Pleistocene consists of, of either of singular finds of burnt flints or occasionally burnt bones, or in a number of cases in Eastern Africa, the sites of Chesawanja and, and, and Kubi Fora, both which date to a little older, older than 1.3 million years ago, okay, burnt patches of, of uh, sediment, sediment that appears to have been exposed to fire. The site of Wanderberg Cave, which dates to about 1.2 million years ago, has provided a recent case study of, of what appears to be very strong evidence for fire use. And my, my colleague uh, will discuss this momentarily. The pattern that, that, pick, that, that jumps out of the early Pleistocene, though, is a pattern of, of an association between fire and the relatively larger brain members of the genus Homo. Evidence for fire is very, very scarce, if, if, if indeed present at all in the earlier phases of the early Pleistocene. And indeed, when we move back into the Pliocene time ranges between uh, two and a half million years ago to back to eight million years ago, evidence for fire is essentially, a, a, evidence for fire kindled by humans is essentially non-existent. So when we look at the early Pleistocene evidence for fire, what are we thinking that humans are doing with this stuff? By and large, we archaeologists believe that they may have, early humans may have been using you know, fire to speed up woodworking. There's evidence for, for uh, wooden tools being carved from basically every early Pleistocene site that preserves wood. And we think they were probably cooking animal meat and, and, and animal tissues because we find occasional traces of burning on animal bones from these sites. But the evidence is very patchy and, and very sparse and doesn't seem to follow clear patterns which suggests that, to many of us that maybe the use of fire is not habitual among these earlier humans. But there's the thing. We don't have an example of non-habitual fire use among recent humans. So we have, in theory, kind of almost a science fiction problem. What would it be like to be human but not to control fire? Can we imagine a life like that? That's one of the big challenges for investigating this issue, taking the leap of, of, of imagination beyond what you can actually see in the world around you to imagining a different way of being human, an possibly an ancestral way of, becoming, of being human. So what broad patterns jump out of, of the uh, evidence for the paleoanthropology of fire? Well, as I've said, the strongest associations between fire and ancestral hominins is between the larger brain members of, of the genus Homo, that's to say ourselves, Homo, Homo sapiens, <laughs> sorry, Homo neanderthalensis of the Neanderthals, our recent, uh, recently extinct cousins, the last common ancestor of ourselves of the Neanderthals, Homo heidelbergensis, and arguably, arguably Homo erectus, the ancestor of Homo heidelbergensis. There are weaker associations, if indeed any at all, b between um, evidence for fire and the Australopithecines and Paranthropines, so robust Australopithecines, and earlier hominins, and the association between Homo floresiensis, the, the so-called hobbits of, of Island of Flores in Indonesia, these are equivocal. We've got evidence of, of fire in the same levels as them, but we also have this evidence also dates from a time period when Homo sapiens was in the neighborhood. So to whom to attribute this evidence of fire, we're not certain. Now, this association could suggest, could suggest, the correlation isn't always cause, that there's a link between the use of fire and the more derived characteristics of the genus Homo, such as our brain enlargement and relative degree of dental reduction. We don't have as big teeth as, the, as, our, as other hominin species do. But it's important to remember that these trends, 
encephalization or the growth of the large brain and the dental reduction. These are trends that are already apparent in the fossil record long before evidence for consistent and habitual use of fire by the genus Homo. So that's a bit of a, a mismatch in the archaeological record that we need to reconcile, and we can reconcile that by bringing together evidence from what we know about fire as used by recent humans and we, what we think we know about fire as used by our, by our hominin ancestors. We have many more questions than answers about this. This is why archaeology is a fun kind of dialogue between the past and the present. We get our questions from one and bring them to the other and try to resolve them. Okay. So let's consider a few of these important questions. Are we seeing evidence for fire? When and where we ought to expect it? And if we're not seeing that evidence, why aren't we seeing it? Is it the case that the absence of evidence for fire in cold European glacial climates does that indicate humans had found some way of surviving in these cold climates? Or is it simply that we're looking in the wrong places in landscapes that maybe that, aren't, that don't preserve good evidence for the use of fire? When we do see evidence for the use of fire, what can we infer from that evidence about hominin behavior? What were earlier humans doing with fire? Were they simply warming their hands? Were they scare, scaring away animals? Were they carving wood? Both, all three, not, none of those three? How broadly can we generalize? What does a heart that burned for a, 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 at one site for a day or two in apply about hominin fire use more broadly over time and in space? Can you generalize it to, to decades and hundreds of kilometers, to, to thousands of years, to millennia, or hundreds of thousands of kilometers? What are li the credible limits of inference from one trace of a hearth to the broader world of hominin adaptation? And lastly, and most importantly, are we equating pattern with process? Are we mistaking the pattern in which the evidence is preserved for the process that created it? Is weaker evidence for fire in more ancient contexts a real pattern? Does it track a, a, a trajectory in human control of fire, or is it simply a reflection of preservation bias, a filtering effect imposed by the archaeological and geological records? I don't pretend to have the answers to these questions. I hope that as a result of this dialogue, we may move our, ourselves a little closer to credible answers to them. Thank you. Thanks, John. One of the most recent and exciting possible answers to some of the questions that, that John Shea just raised in his presentation to you was presented uh, last year in an exciting article that appeared, I believe, in the journal Science uh, by uh, two of our, my colleagues here at Boston University, Professors Goldberg and Berna in the Department of Archaeology, who reported evidence consistent with the use of fire by human beings earlier than uh, any comparable evidence had been presented uh, previously, dating back to approximately 1.2 million years in Wunderwerk Cave in South Africa. Um, we've asked Professor Berner to come here today and uh, sketch the evidence available for the antiquity of fire going back to this time period, and uh, to give us all a chance to examine the evidence and discuss it with him. So without further ado, I'll turn this over to you, Francesco. So, first of all, thank you so much to Matt and Kate who have organized this um, wonderful dialogue. I couldn't say no when they invited me. This is what I like to do. And indeed, um, our um, paper uh, reignited um, the debate that was kind of uh, asleep for a while. And here today I want to ma mainly bring the perspective and the experience of uh, geoarchaeologists and how we deal with uh, looking for traces of human activities and use of space uh, and then also fire in uh, um, archaeological sites. Um, one thing I'd like to start is like um, John um, mention is maybe what's more interesting is not when humans started using fire because they could have started occasionally but when actually they use it they start using it habitually mainly they took full advantage of this powerful tool uh, for um, you know any possible um, 
reproductive and um, successful uh, um, of their own uh, group and species. So it's like basically what I was trying to say, like any invention, uh, the control use of fire um, can be um, only important when it's used extensively enough to give advantages to a uh, population. I don't know if you agree, but that's, I think, other ways. Just to um, recap a little bit, uh, um, so today uh, we, like John very well explained, um, we deal in with, with three major hypotheses about who was the first Prometheus. So oh, the first hypothesis uh, points to Homo sapiens. Second hypothesis points to Homo heidelbergensis, which is the common ancestor of sapiens and Neanderthals, and probably the Nisovans and Floresiensis. And of course, the most um, intriguing and uh, Homo erectus, as part of the uh, Richard Rankin hypothesis of the cooking hypothesis, where basically states that um, Homo erectus was fully adapted to the cooked diet, um, a cooked food diet, so it must have um, know very well habitually using fire. Um, Here, I'd like to uh, show you that we could probably test these three hypotheses a wonder work based on our recent um, discoveries. So let me tell you why. Let's start to put um, wonder work on a map, because it's not a very famous site yet. And as you can see, is um, about six, seven hundred kilometers away from Johannesburg and the cradle of humankind. So it's pretty, you know, on the western side of the major human um, hominin fossil um, find. But Taung is pretty close, about 50 kilometers. The cave is. Um, beautiful, gigantic, massive cave, very hospitable, and is located in a wonderful location, overlooking wonderful, you know, very wild landscape. And um, it was excavated um, for several years, in the 70s and the 90s. And then, um, because there were no find of hominids, was kind of uh, lost interest, and was lost interest also in um, an amount, an amazing amount of um, equified artifact, real beautiful um, tools, and so on. In 2004, uh, a team led by Professor Michael Chason from the University of um, Toronto. Um, Leora Horowitz from uh, Jerusalem University, the Hebrew University, and David Morris from uh, Kimberley Museum, uh, the McGregor Museum in Kimberley in South Africa. They gather um, a big team, multidisciplinary team, and started working on the collection that was left in the museums and start doing chronological dating of the sediments and site environmental reconstruction and site formation processes. So now at Wonderwerk, we're dealing with a cave which is 140 meter long. In some area, it reaches almost 20 meters width and has a depth of sediment of about um, three meters and maybe more. Um, this is a uh, laser scanning 3D models that, that our geomatics expert um, collected and we're working on. And here shows uh, the different area of the excavation. And today I will mainly talk about excavation one, which is close to the entrance. 
It's about 25 meters inside. And then excavation six, which is at the bottom of the cave. Um, we now know with certain degree of, <laughs> uh, of certainty that uh, the, at the bottom of the stratigraphy, the occupation, the cave was started to be occupied uh, around 1.8, 1.7 million years ago by a group of hominins that left behind Olduvayan, Olduvayan uh, tools made in chert. We know that then the occupation shifted into different phases of Achelian, and in the Achelian phase, uh, we find earliest secure evidence of archaeological uh, of fire burning in archaeological context. Moving up the time scale, uh, in, in excavation six. Uh, we find um, tools and of flower smith, which is um, dated about five to three hundred thousand years ago. And this is a, a very important, um, it's like a rising star uh, technology or little complex, the flower smith, because it's characterized by uh, blade production and possibly first use of pigments. In fact, at Wonderberg we found an incised um, iron stone that was probably used to scrape um, the hematite. And so it's, it's linked to the, the incipience of modern human behavior uh, and um, probably also linked to Homo heidelbergensis, heidelbergensis. Then, of course, we have a Middle Stone Age and later Stone Age. So it's clear that Wonderwerk not only has fire, but has a fantastic and unique situation where you can study human occupation from the origin to the modern time. Uh, in particular, we the fire that we are working on, the evidence of fire that we're working on, comes from um, excavation one, um, principally because it's the one now the rich sterile bottom, so we have the complete sequence from the bottom up. Um, just to recap again, in excavation one, in fact, we have uh, old Duvayan, uh, at the bottom, and then few faces of a Shelian. Um, combination or integration of uh, cosmogenic dates and magnetostratigraphy it puts the old Vine around 1.7, 1.8 million years ago, and the uh, Achelian uh, from 1.4 to around 1.1 million years ago. As far as of evidence of fire in excavation one, we have two major evidence. We have evidence from the old one and evidence from the Achelian. Here is the old one evidence and here is the Achelian. And this is the close up of the same section I showed you before. Um, so if we look at the evidence of fire during the old one, we have uh, bones that we determined unequivocally by FTR spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy, that are burned above 500 degrees, at or above 500 degrees. In stratum 12, these burned bones are associated to these white layers here. But once you put these white layers in a block like this, I have the block here if you want to see it, and you produce a thin section, what you can see is that the white material and the black material that were considered part of ashes, they actually, this is here, they actually are just limestone 
and dollar stones that are altered differently in a way that look like actually hearth, all right? So <clears throat> we know there is burn bone, but we don't know where this burn bone were burnt. You know? So we have burn bone, but not the um, origins, not the sourcing. When we go up and we look at the uh, up to stra the stratigraphy and we look at the evidence of fire, they were found in an area which we wouldn't expect actually to find. So this is very interesting. We, and we only found them because we put them into a thin section like I showed you before, something that thin, okay? And so here, the thin section that we produced from the, the stratum 10 shows that the stratum 10 is composed of a series of cave um, layers or floors, let's say, surfaces. See this one, see that one. And on top of the surfaces, you have uh, anthropogenic objects where you have bones. And, and then some of these um, surfaces are actually buried under clay, pure clay droppings that we believe are nests of uh, swift or birds of form. So it's, it's a fantastic situation. And when by FTI infrared spectroscopy, you, you measure the bones embedded in those um, surface, they, a lot of them appears to be burnt uh, 500 degrees and so on. So that, so where is the fire coming from? Oops, sorry. So once we, we go to the extreme corner here and we zoom in at higher magnification to um, this particular area of the cave and we look at this specific surface here, we notice that the surface was scattered with this charred plant material. It looks like charred twigs, charred leaves, charred grasses. And at the same time, also here, there's burned bones. So what appears, it's, there is a fire very close, and that is depositing um, this charred material. And the preservation states tell us that this um, ash material didn't fly from a long distance. And remember, we are 25 meters inside the cave. So all this for us is compatible with a series of little fires burned 25 meters inside the cave on different uh, uh, surfaces. So it's it's some kind of a beach wall, but you know, maybe it's occasional, but it's something going on. And so we also wanted to have some other proof of in situ burning, burning in situ there. So <clears throat> when we went back to the collection and we start analyzing the bone fragments that were collected, many of those were uh, heated to show uh, FTIR that patterns that characteristic of heated, um, of heated um, bones, but also what's very characteristic is the sediment associated to it, to these bones were heated too. So it looks like, you know, here we have, you know, uh, burning in the sediment. So it's a good indication. The other interesting thing is to, uh, a lot of these bones come from an area close to what we, where we found the microscopic evidence, but comes also from different levels. So it's another evidence of multiple burning episodes. Finally, 
when we went and looked at uh, the lithics, the stone tools, we found that uh, some of those had clear sign of being heated, and those signs are called pot lids or, you know, spallations that are this kind of a scar into a bigger pieces. And we could find in situ, basically, the positive and the negative. So that tells us that the fire is definitely burning inside the cave. So um, we, what we stated is, and we want to make sure we, everything we found is compatible with human controlling fire, but we couldn't prove it so far. You know, if this was a deposit of a later period, like let's say uh, a Mousterian, people would probably have no problem uh, thinking that this was a um, man-made fire. What we cannot prove yet is that this is a habitual use of fire, and we cannot prove that there was any cooking going on. So, uh, but it's, it's a very important uh, discovery, and so we want to go in and go in to the bottom of it. So uh, we set up a program to um, explore and test, basically, this uh, hypothesis um, at Wonderwerk. And uh, so we'll characterize along the column uh, all the fire that we'll find, all the fire evidence that we'll find, and we will test uh, for control fire, because we know there could be also natural fire burning inside the caves. And ultimately, I think the key um, evidence to understand if Homo erectus was using fire habitually, we were looking also for testing the cooking hypothesis. So if you give me two minutes, I'll show you how we want to do that. So we're going to excavate, a small scale excavation. We have the permit and we're going to do that and we're going to actually unite um, excavation one with the uh, excavation two. We'll use a microstratigraphic approach, which is basically excavating very, very slowly, a very uh, uh, thick um, speeds and following any subunits that we could see. At the same time, we will do systematic on-site uh, collection of intact blocks here and collect you know, loose samples and then make overnight petrographic thin sections so we can control what are we doing. Because what, what we learn from this work at Wonderwerk is that the evidence it's very ephemeral. So we need to be careful and not lose it, because once it's lost, it's lost. Um, the other thing we want to do it and do on-site analysis of burned and unburned material, and you know, also look at bone. And what's very important is um, to map every item and do the, dis the spatial distribution in order uh, to understand uh, the significance of these patterns and if there is any anthropogenicity and any uh, evidence of control fire. Of course, this is has to be integrated with a full understanding of the site formation, so to understand if there is any taphonomy, any disturbance in the sediments, that it's overprinting maybe an original uh, anthropogenic setting. And finally, we will try to work on uh, determine if bones or other residues in the sediment can tell us if 
meat was cooked, or especially if um, vegetation was cooked, because that's probably the most important um, uh, aspect of a cooked diet, that it's very hard to... Um, so, to, to sum up, I think that uh, Wonderwerk really reignited a little bit of debate, and it's definitely um, a site that will uh, help us to have great insights into um, who was the first Prometheus. Thank you for you. Thanks very much, Francesco. Uh, this is a really exciting site, and I know we're going to want to talk about it a lot. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes remaining in this hour's webcast, but we're going to be continuing this discussion and asking questions about all sorts of aspects of both the Wunderwerk cave deposits and sites and the meaning and history of the use of fire by human beings in the uh, concluding portion of today's dialogue, the panel discussion, which will begin here on the fourth floor of the uh, Hillel Center in, uh, on the Boston University Charles River campus at 5 p.m. So if you'd like to come over and hear some more about this, participate, and ask questions of your own, please do. In, uh, in preparation for this, we've asked uh, students in our classes and some of our colleagues to uh, send in questions after reading the written statements that, that you, John, and you, Francesco, provided that are available on, on our website. Uh, and I'd like to throw out some of these questions to you that uh, deal with some of the things that, directly with some of the things that you've talked about. Um, I think we're probably going to sort of try to leave the whole set of issues surrounding the biological meaning of cooking until we get into the, um, the panel discussion at 5 o'clock. <clears throat> but there's a lot of other things that, that I think... Uh, uh, people are interested in hearing about because they've sent in questions to ask about them. So first of all, I'd, I'd like to start by asking you, Francesco, yeah. uh, how, how are the deposits at Van der Werk Cave dated? You've got this, this wonderful sort of grand canyon of, of human technology, you know, the entire geological column from the old Awan almost two million years ago, 1.7, I think you said, up, up to the present. You know, we've got rock art and, and, I, and I doubt not uh, tin cans and, and Coke bottles. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, how are these strata being dated? Uh, what, are, what are the dating techniques that are being used? So what we used is um, cosmogenic isotopes, beryllium-10 and aluminum-26. And basically what we get there is a burial age. So that has to be factored in with the residence time of the sediment outside and then in. So if you actually uh, calculate the, the real age, it's much, much older. So if, if you don't factor in the resident site outside the cave. And um, so the idea here, for just for the benefit of yeah. people who may not be familiar with burial dating, correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea here is that there are certain kinds of, of mineral uh, crystals and compounds which when they are impacted by high energy cosmic radiation, um, some of the atoms undergo uh, a, a, a transmutation to, to other yeah. elements or other isotopes. And so you can tell in principle how long the, the thing has been lying out there subjected to, to cosmic radiation. Exactly. Then, but if it becomes buried, then those those unstable isotopes that have been produced by cosmic radiation begin to break down into yet other sorts of things. And so by looking at the ratios among these various categories of isotopes, you can get an idea of how long it's been buried under the assumption that it had been lying out on the surface for some period of time. And yeah. Yeah. The, that's the, the, the unknown, how long it was buried outside a cave before being blown in and start, what we say, bleaching or ticking. Yeah. So... But, um, but for instance, um, I'm not sure, uh, we, we have some data on the tools per, per se, and those are, you know, basically, if, if it's considered fire smith, it's about 500,000 years old. So 
But what I think it's very important is, is not the, the chronological absolute date, it's the sequence that we have, and it's definitely you know, associated to different hominids. So we can say with a certain degree of uh, certainty that you know, the Wonderful Cave saw probably Homo erectus coming in and then different hominids going on. So one of our correspondents writes in and asks to ask you to tell us what your next steps are regarding the testing the hypothesis that the human control of fire begins with Homo erectus. The important thing is, as I say, we, we're going to do a high resolution microstratigraphic, microstratigraphic uh, excavation that will imply uh, mapping online, basically, in real time. Uh, the uh, objects, and by the, the distribution, we can try to see if there is any uh, pattern. So, for instance, the circular pattern of burn, uh, or uh, so distri a differential distribution of items could uh, give us an idea if it's, um, you know, it's a random structure or is actually anthropogenic. Did you say more? Yeah, just, okay, well, I have a question for you. Then. Right. And one of the things you raised in your presentation was the, the environmental effects yes. of fire, uh, you know, the, of, of widespread burning, what you call fire stick. Uh, fire stick farming. Fire stick farming, yeah. Um, so the question is, uh, two questions. First of all, are there any ways that you could detect by looking at Pleistocene ecosystems, the evidence for Pleistocene ecology, the advent of, of anthropogenic fire as a, as a landscape shaping feature? In theory, in theory you could. Um, but much of what our environmental reconstructions of vegetal landscapes depend upon are sequences of, of sediments, drilled you know, cores drilled through lake sediments, and mm -hmm. in amongst the pollen that indicates the vegetation of the surrounding area, that lake catchment, you also find traces of charcoal. So if humans have, have suddenly accelerated their burning of the landscape, their foraging of fuel, mm -hmm. we'd expect to see an uptick in the amount of carbon being deposited. Right. That, that's what I was wondering because, I mean, presuming that the rate of the production of natural fires has always been a constant. Well, no, not necessarily. The, the changes in veg vegetation can make landscapes differentially susceptible to, to uh, fire. Mm -hmm. But you, you need to work hard to sort out the natural from the cultural signals there. But in theory, one could do it. You'd need to do a lot of research in terms of the effect of, of uh, controlled burning on contemporary landscapes to work out the recognition criteria for anthropogenic fire. Mm -hmm. So assuming that, that the con, con, that human burning, human landscape pyrogenesis uh, <laughs> uh, had, a, had a major effect on, on the environment, mm -hmm. would you like to speculate on what effects these environmental changes in turn might have had on, on human populations and on human evolutions? Well, in terms of, of fire stick farming, it, it probably would increase them. I mean, the populations, we, we've always been uh, you know, manipulating the, the surrounding landscape to improve our, our odds. And, you know, um, in fact, well, we don't have to look very far away. Right here in New England, in, in pre-colonial times, Native Americans burned the landscape. Or, you know, around the Europe time Europeans showed up, many Native American populations plummeted due to the, the, the uh, diseases, cholera and typhoid and the rest. Mm -hmm. The, the forestic farmers were gone. The landscape got covered with cat briar and other kinds of thorns that made it very, very difficult for Europeans to, you know, to navigate this landscape and gave tremendous advantage to the small uh, you know, numbers of guerrilla fighters, here, Native Americans who were resisting European invasions, literally within a few you know, hundred miles of, the, of where we're sitting right now. So this, is, you know, this, this changes in the landscape in, in, in terms of fire. Fire is a potent force. And both its presence and its absence can, can, can have important influences on history. But the bottom line is when you fire the landscape, you encourage new growth. The new growth is, is favorable to uh, foraging or uh, uh, browsers, uh, deer, and, and um, you can make it less costly to go after the, these prey animals simply by lighting a, lighting a fire and uh, burning off the dead uh, wood, the dead vegetation that, that um, covers the understory of many forests. Mm -hmm. as, as you've noted, um, animals tend to fear and shun fire. It's a, it's a device that people use for making sure that the, the, the predators aren't sneaking up on them in the middle of the night. Um, how, given that fact, 
can you envision a, a, a primate, a non-fire-using hominid, being attracted to fire and wanting to come and play with it? I mean, is there any animal analogy for this sort of thing happening? I and mean, presumably, some sort of initial step like that would have been necessary to uh, to lead to the human manipulation and use of fire. Well, predators learn. This is the, 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 the dilemma of being a, a predator is you have to learn, you have to adapt and, and recognize clues, which is you know, hunter, a contemporary hunter who wants to track animals. You know, predators learn signs. You know, lions can read the you know, vultures, vultures circling patterns. Um, we've even seen this in the field when a, when a fire sweeps across the grasslands in, in Ethiopia. There are raptor birds plummeting in and out in front of the fire, picking off the, the uh, smaller prey that are fleeing the fire's advance. And there are other birds and animals that come in afterwards to pick, up, pick off the uh, charred carcasses of the animals that are overcome by fire. So it, it's not that unreasonable to extrapolate that early hominids had at least as, many, as much brain power as, say, a, a bird does. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, but, but that's not being attracted to fire. That's being attracted to cooked ground squirrels. You know, that, you know population equals cause. At some point, it's just record these ancestral humans that bright stuff is related to the, uh, you know, the open buffet service table <laughs> on the savanna. Yeah, okay. Not that big of a stretch of the imagination. Um, would, you, would you like to comment on the antiquity of the supposed evidence for fire at Kubifora and Chesalonja? These are burnt patches. These are reddened areas of, of uh, clay and other soils that are just circular. They range from oh, 30 to 50 centimeters in, in diameter. And um, early excavations there suggest these might have been fire. There are some of uh, my colleagues who still believe this is, is uh, evidence of early, uh, either early trees burning but from hit by lightning or, or early hearths being kindled. But I think most folks who look, most colleagues who look at this evidence uh, believe it's difficult to distinguish these burnt patches from naturally occurring fires. Trees get hit by lightning out in the open landscapes of East Africa all the time. They, they're often very dry and they'll burn un down into the ground. But uh, Francesco, I think you have a comment on this yeah, as well. Yeah, um, actually I'm working with Jack Aris on micromorphology of yes. these excavation areas, and we will try to figure out better the nature. But so far it looks like we have a mm -hmm. um, chunk of burnt sediment, mm -hmm. but there is no really other mm -hmm. burnt material associated yeah. to it. So it's probably burned somewhere and transported there. If you're looking for a gold standard for human-like use of fire, it's yeah. the recharging of the fire, the yeah. bringing of the fuel to it. So it's really important in your microstratigraphic analysis to see if you can detect, you know, the, the dying of the fire, the reignition of the fire, the recharging of the fire. Like, if you've like got that, that, yeah, like, that, well, you know, that, that is the gold standard. <laughs> yes, Have you I got know. repetitive use of the same location, bringing fuel to the ignition point? Yeah. If you got that, you convinced everybody. I know, I know. <laughs> it but won't you, be easy. You don't have that. At That's what. Okay. <laughs> Wonder Verke, we don't have that, you know, but uh, it's like a series of surfaces, and it's just now the evidence we have, it's on a corner, so we're, we're planning to open more, and from the, un the known to the unknown, and see. And has anybody looked, uh, is there Pliocene, Miocene, Eocene <laughs> evidence? in microstratigraphy from appropriate sites for the occurrence of wildfires? So we have some idea of what the distribution and appearance of fires looks like in the certain absence of human intervention? I think there, there is an uptick in suspected occurrences of natural fire in, in the Pliocene and maybe the late Miocene. Of course, this varies from region to region. But now we're, we're venturing off the, uh, the time chart of those which archaeologists ordinarily um, concern themselves. <laughs> Okay. Well, we will have some paleontologists, or, well, one paleontologist, uh, with us on the panel this, later this afternoon. And so maybe we'll have an opportunity to talk about it under those circumstances. So I, I'd like to uh, wrap up this first session in our seventh BU Dialogues in Biological Anthropology by once again reminding you of and inviting you to attend um, our panel discussion, our, our roundtable discussion uh, this afternoon here in this same room on the fourth floor of the uh, Hillel Center on uh, the Boston University campus, where we will be talking more broadly about the biological meaning of fire in terms of its effects on and um, consequences for human evolutionary change during the 
roughly two million year period that the genus Homo has been in existence. Um, so we'll be uh, joined by my colleague, the biological anthropologist Jeremy De Silva, and uh, we'll be exploring together with those of you in the audience who, who come to uh, this session uh, some of the uh, wider implications of fire and larger theories about its meaning for our origins. So let me conclude this afternoon's first session by thanking uh, both John Shea and Francesco Berna for being with us here today and for telling us all the things that we've heard about early fire, its meaning and importance, its distribution, and we're going to be going into this in considerably more depth, I hope with your help, later this afternoon. <laughs>